In this video, we're going to talk about data structures. So lists, vectors, hash maps, objects, interfaces, and inheritance. We'll also use it as a chance to discuss some of the interoperability with Java objects and how to create Java objects and call Java methods from your closure programs. Just like before, I'm going to open up a little test file and connect CIDR into it. So a list enclosure is just a list of stuff. So for example, list one, two, three, four is just a list of the numbers one, two, three, and four. Now closure is dynamically typed, so I can put anything I want in here. So I can make a list of strings, doubles, etc. I can even make a list with different types of stuff in it. I could do something like this and it would be perfectly valid closure. Although it's not usually recommended because it makes your code a little bit unreadable. Internally, lists and closure are linked lists, which as a refresher means that every element has a value and a pointer to the next element in the list, except for the last element, which points to nil, the null value. And so if we want to, we can actually write down structurally what this list represents. At the end of the list, we have nil. And if we wanted to represent just the very end of the list, we'd have an element with a value of four and something that points to the rest of the list, which in this case is nil. And then if we wanted to represent the last two elements of the list, we would start with the first element, which has a value of three and points to the rest of the list. So the rest of the list is this piece here, which we can see is the same as this piece over here. The last three elements would look like this. And just for completeness, the whole list would look like this. Now, what's really interesting is that structurally, these are the same thing. So when I write list one, two, three, four, I get this really nice looking syntax for it. But since this is a linked list, this is still how it's structurally represented under the hood. When you're working with lists and closure, it's really important to remember this underlying linked list structure. Because when I define a list, let's say I define X to be the list one, two, three, four. What the variable X actually represents is the first node in the list. So X is a node with a value of one and a pointer to the rest of the list. We can get the value inside of that first element by typing first X. And as we can see, this is the value of the first node in the list. And then we can get the rest of the list, the thing that the first node actually points to by typing rest of X. And as we can see, this returns the rest of the list. If we wanted to get the value of one of the middle elements, let's say the third element of the list, we're starting at the first node one. So we'd have to follow the pointers to get to the second node and then the third node before returning its value. And this is sort of the inverse of the cons that we did earlier. So rest of X gets you the list starting at node two. Rest of rest of X gets you the list starting at node three. And then calling first gets you the actual value, which is three. Now, if we didn't want to type all of this out, we could use the function nth to get the nth element, zero index, just like arrays. But under the hood, it's calling rest until it gets to the third element of the list. So as you probably already know, it's going to take linear time to access an element in the middle of a linked list. By default, lists and closure are immutable, but you can always add elements to it by making a new node and pointing it to an existing list. So if I wanted to add the element zero to the front of this list, I could do cons zero X, which creates a new node with a value of zero and a pointer to our existing list. And so if I evaluate this, I can see the list zero, one, two, three, four, which remember is the same as a list that looks like this under the hood. Now what's really neat here is because this just points back to our original list, it happens in constant time. And we've created what's effectively a copy of our original list with the new element attached but the copy doesn't take up any extra space because the new list and the original list share the same bits of memory. Now, lists are a neat and mathematically elegant data structure, but they're missing a lot of things that we're used to from our good friends, arrays and array lists, like the ability to look up or modify things in the middle of the list in constant or near constant time. What we want is a data structure where inserts, modifications and element access happen in constant or near constant time. Closure's answer to this is vectors. Vectors are an immutable data structure that support the same interface as most of the common list functions, but provide lookups and updates in near constant time. So if I wanna get the nth element of a vector, I would just use the same nth function and it would work exactly the way that you would expect, but it would happen much faster for large lists. 
If I wanted to update a value within a vector, I would use this function asoc, short for associate, which sets the value of the third element. Remember, the third element is at index 2 to 100. If I wanted, I could also set the value of the first element to 100, and it would look like this. Now what's really interesting is that just like lists, vectors are immutable, which means that when you set this value, it's actually not modifying the original vector. What it's doing is it's creating a new vector, a copy of the original with that one element changed, and then returning it as a result. So this is actually creating a new copy with the modified data. What's amazing about closure vectors though, is they do this and they're still super efficient. So they're creating copies everywhere, but they're still doing it with log n update speed and without consuming significantly more memory. It sounds impossible and magical, I know, but if you don't believe me, I made a full video on how this stuff works, which I'll link in the description down below. Now, I know some of you are degens who are just itching to modify things. And don't worry, Clojure has a way to do mutable stuff too. And so the way that you do this is called an atom. And in this case, an atom is a mutable container for an immutable value. So this one right here is just a value, uh, it's just a number. It's not something that you can edit or change. But this atom of one is like a box containing the number one. And so even though the value one is immutable, you can change what's inside of the box. So what we can say is we can say, take the number one out of the box and replace it with a value of two. And now if we go and we look inside of the box, we can see that the box now contains a value of two. Now closure is untyped, so we can put anything we want in the box. And then if we go and we look inside of it, we'll see the thing that we just put there. We can also do the same thing with vectors. So if we have vector one, two, three, four, remember this vector is immutable, but then we can make a box containing this vector and change what's inside the box. So let's go back to our original example and see if we can replicate the behavior of setting a value in an array. Remember, we can use the function asoc to update a value in a vector. But in this case, mutable vector isn't just a vector. It's a box containing a vector. And so before we do this function to it, we have to look in the box and grab its value. Now, if I go ahead and I execute this, I can see it returns a new vector with the value modified. This just returns a new value though. It doesn't actually modify the contents of the original box. So in order to actually mutate the value of mutable vector, we would have to use reset to update the box to contain this new value. Now I know what you're thinking. This is a lot of code for a relatively simple operation. I just wanted to show you guys what it looks like written out all the way. But fortunately, Clojure has a lot of ways to make doing stuff like this easier. For one, instead of writing deref, you can also access the value inside of an atom by typing the at symbol. So it would look something like this, and we can replace the deref in our code with something that looks like this. The at symbol is just an abbreviated syntax for calling deref, and under the hood it's actually a reader macro, which we'll get into later when we talk about symbols and macros. Now this is way shorter, but I know you want to do even better. So something special that we can do is call this function swap, Basically what we're doing here is we're taking mutable vector, applying a function to it, and then resetting its value to the output of that function. So in general, what we're doing is this, to update the value of a variable by applying some function to it. This pattern is so common that there's this special function called swap, which takes in an atom and a function, as well as some additional arguments, and then updates the atom with the result of applying that function. So this right here is equivalent to calling this right here. Swap is a general purpose tool, so we can also use it for other atoms and other types of functions. So for example, if I had this atom containing an integer, the function inc get integer plus one. So if I evaluate this, I would see the output is two. So if I wanted to do the equivalent of var plus plus, I could do swap var one inc, which basically updates the variable var one with the output of applying inc to the underlying value. So this is the equivalent of doing reset var one to the output of inc of var one. Something that's kind of neat here is reset is sort of similar to what you would do in other languages, where you would use equals to edit the value of a variable. But a lot of languages don't have an equivalent to swap, even though it's really convenient and super useful. So score one for closure. Next up, and sort of similar to vectors, we have hash maps. Just like in any other language, 
A hash map is a map from keys to values. So I could create one like this to get a mapping from A to one, B to two, C to three, etc. I could create a map of numbers to strings, and these are all untyped, so I can even mix them together. I can use anything I want for the keys and the values, as long as the keys are hashable. Now, you can create a hash map by calling this function with all of its keys and values as inputs, but it's much more common to use this map syntax, which looks like this. It's just easier to read and looks a little bit more like JSON, but notice that it doesn't have any colons or commas. Commas are actually considered white space enclosure, so you can use them if you want, or not use them, but they don't do anything, they just act effectively like a space character. I forgot to mention this earlier, but you can also do the same type of thing for vectors. So instead of creating a vector using vector 1, 2, 3, 4, I could write it like this with these little square brackets, and it would return the same thing. Now, when you have a hash map, there's a few things you might want to do with it. But the most important ones are to insert new values into the map and to look up the value associated with a particular key. So to insert a new value, we're actually going to use the same asoc function for associate. And we can say asoc my map, and then we can give it a key and a value, and it will put that key value pair into the map. So in this case, we're putting the pair d1 into the map. Now this works exactly the same way as calling a sock on a vector. So this returns a new immutable copy of the map. And importantly, it does not change the original map. If I wanted to get a mutable hash map, I would have to do the same trick where I wrap it in an atom and then use swap or reset to update the value. Now if I go and I dereference my mutable map, I can see that the new key value pair was added. If I have an existing map, I can also use the function get to look up the value of a key in that map. If I look up a value that doesn't exist, I get nil or the null value. Now there's two ways that people tend to use hash maps. There's the standard way to model a relationship between two types of related data, like a mapping from dates to the temperature outside. But another way people use hash maps, more typically with JSON style data, as a replacement for structs or data-only object types, where each instance of the hash map has a fixed set of keys representing the fields of that struct. So if I wanted to represent the weather for just one particular day and do it as a structured piece of information, I could make a hash map that looks something like this. This hash map is sort of the analog to making a class with the following fields and you can see it represents the same sort of structured information. Now, using strings to represent field names feels like a little bit of an anti-pattern. So if you're making hash maps to represent this type of data, Clojure has a special tool called keywords, which look like this and are generally used to represent keys in a hash map that hold this kind of structured data. They're also used sometimes as a replacement for enums or things like that. So instead of writing out our map with strings like this, the more idiomatic way would be to write it out with keywords like this. Something that's really nice here is that keywords are also treated by default as access functions. So instead of writing get my map date, I could instead just write date of my map, where date is treated as a function that looks up the key date inside of my map. And so this does exactly the same thing as get, but it's just a little bit shorter for convenience. So if I tried to do the same thing for strings, I would get an error. Now, if you're used to languages like Java and C++, you might find it kind of weird to use a map to represent structured data, but this actually works pretty much the same way as the object system in JavaScript or Python. So it isn't a new pattern or anything like that. And because looking up a key with a keyword is so fast that it sort of feels like a field access. Now, I know some of you are looking at this and thinking, this should have more structure. In most languages, you would declare what fields an object should have so that you don't wind up with something like this, where different instances of the same object use different field names to represent the same type of data, or at least so something is documented. In Clojure, we have this thing called records, which are basically a way of defining what fields a structure should have. So I can define a type of record by calling def record, uh, give it the name of the record, and then a vector of the fields that it should have. And then once I've defined it, I can instantiate it by passing in values for all the fields, just like what you would see in a typical Java constructor. 
Now, records come out of the box with all of the syntax that you're used to from dealing with hash maps. So you can access values by providing the keyword. And this gets you the value of the date field in the map. You can also use a sock to edit a value. And it works exactly the same way as it would if you were calling a sock on a hash map. You can even put fields that weren't in the original record definition. But what makes records special and what sets them apart from maps are two big things. The first is that these fields are documented and part of the type definition. So if you have a weather record, you know that it's going to have access to these field keys. And what's really special is under the hood, it's actually implemented like a Java object, which means that field access gets you the same native performance as Java field access. And records work well with the rest of the Java ecosystem. You can think of them as Java objects that have an implementation of HashMap built on top of them. And in particular, what this means is that Clojure records can implement Java interfaces. So you can define a record in Clojure and then pass that object into existing Java libraries. So for example, if I want to define a record that implements a particular Java interface, I could define a record just like before, but then additionally specify the interface to implement as well as the implementation of all of its methods, where this is the value containing the current object, just like in Java. Now records are basically just Java objects that have a hash map implementation on top of them. Because it works like a closure hash map, the fields in a record are also immutable by default. If instead you really want an object that works more like a traditional Java object, so basically something with no hash map implementation and mutable fields just like you might be used to, you can instead use def type, which is basically the same thing, but without the hash map stuff and the immutability. This is basically the most similar to an OG Java object without any closure stuff and opinions added. If you want to define your own interface, you can do it with a protocol, which looks like this. So basically you would give it the name of the interface and a list of all of the methods that should be available if you implement that interface. So if I wanted to get the protocol for date info, I could do to define the corresponding interface. Now protocols actually let you do even more than existing Java interfaces but I'll get into that in a little bit more detail when I talk about functions and multi-methods. All right, so now last up, we're gonna talk about how to instantiate and work with existing Java objects. So if I have a Java class that I would normally instantiate like this, I can create the same object in Clojure by calling this function. So if I have this class date, then the constructor for that class is just date with a dot after it, and I can treat this like a normal function. This function is the constructor, and then I can call the constructor with whatever arguments to instantiate the object. Now in Java, once I already have an object, I can call a method like getMonth to access information about that object or to do stuff to it. In Clojure, we would treat getMonth as sort of like a function that takes D as input. So if I wanted to call the same method, I would do dot getMonthD to get the value of the month. This is zero indexed, uh, just in case you're confused by the output. Now this function getMonth doesn't take any arguments, but if it did, let's say it took a number and a string as input, then I could pass the arguments to the method by calling something like this. So it would be the method name, the object that you're calling the method on, and then the arguments to the method. So yeah, that is our quick overview of data structures and objects in Clojure. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about types, methods, and inheritance when we get to the section about functions and multi-methods. So definitely stay tuned for that. Anyway, if you like the video, you already know what to do. Give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.